You're listening to Bigfoot Society Podcast, hosted by our captain, Jeremiah Byron, where it's all Bigfoot all the time. Have you ever had the urge to do more, to be more? Now you can by joining Bigfoot Society on the Patreon. Get ad-free episodes and even member-only episodes. Take part in movie night and even live video chat. Interact behind the scenes with Jeremiah and other Patreon members like me, Leia. The powerful podcast goes on and you may contribute a verse in our Patreon community. Carpe diem. Seize the day, Bigfooters, and make your lives extraordinary. Welcome to Bigfoot Society. If you have Bigfoot activity to report from the same areas discussed in this episode, please reach out to me directly after this episode. And if you'd like to be on the podcast to discuss a personal Bigfoot encounter, please reach out to me directly at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Do you wish there was more Bigfoot Society to listen to every week? Well, there is now. If you become a supporting member over at Patreon, you get a special members-only episode every single week on Wednesdays and sometimes even more episodes. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now let's get on with the show. Hey, Green Eyed, this is Jeremiah. Thanks for coming on up. Uh, go ahead and uh, feel free to share what you experienced in Ohio that day. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. I had I had gone on a live and, and had mentioned this before, but uh, I don't like going lives too much. But oh, this is this is something that runs in my family. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the 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 tri-state area of West Virginia. You got West Virginia, Ohio, and then PA area. Um, <clears throat> the Enon Valley, Enon Valley area. This was like PA, Ohio and um west virginia back in back in the mid 70s we were all me and my cousins we were all, back in the in an ohio area it's we didn't have there was not a lot of uh you know progress you know we was out in the middle of the woods and everything but you got the moon just beautiful and bright you know it you didn't need any light out there and we had we was on our grand grandmother's uh she had a trailer and we were out in her area and we were playing it was nighttime we were out there playing and um there was about five of us and there was a cornfield about 50 feet from her trailer and two of my cousins was out in the back. Now, this is a history. This is something we we was my family would talk about their experience and stuff, but we were, we didn't believe none of this. You know, I mean, really, at this point in my life, I was like, whatever, you know, Bigfoot. Um, my two of my cousins had come out from behind the trailer because they were we were playing a game. We were playing like tag and, and stuff and and. They come out behind the tail, uh, tra trailer screaming, and we're looking at them like, what's their problem? And they run into the trailer, and we thought because they were young, you know, they were just whatever. We didn't know what was going on with them. We didn't care. But something comes flying, coming and running out from behind the trailer, and you you got the moonlight. We know who was out there. There was only five of us. There there's there was five of us that saw that, but the two little ones was had run into the trailer. And... As I'm looking at the, I wish I could have explained this better than when I was explaining on the live, but I can see this dark thing come out from behind the trailer, but it's it's about a hundred feet away from me, and you can't see any details, but it's all dark, and 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 you, we're how far away I am from it. I'm thinking it's one of my cousins, you know. I'm thinking it's because we're chasing each other, but it's kind of coming at me, but coming in an arc. And I mean, and in order to explain how I'm watching this, and I was trying to explain to people, you remember the movie Predator? Mm -hmm. How um, Carl Weathers sees this, that thing coming at him, and he's kind of seeing it coming in an arc at him. Like he's got his weapon and he's kind of looking. I'm watching this thing coming out from behind the trailer, and I'm, I'm gonna, on an angle at him at, at this thing. And I'm thinking, it's my cousin, and I'm thinking, why are you running at me like this? Because we're there, that per, that person wasn't supposed to be chasing me, and it keeps. But the, the amount of how far we were from each other, it took the steps that it was taking was huge, and that's when it came to me like this isn't, this isn't normal. And ever and I when I finally look around, it, it took in a couple seconds. I looked around and I see there's more than one. There's one extra person than there should be. Because the moon was, it was really, really bright. You could see, we could see everybody because it was an open area. It was a very open area. We could see each other. And they start screaming 
and all I am is watching this thing coming in, running past it just in about three or four steps walk ran right past me a brush and I had to look up literally had to look up to see I was trying to see what this was I, I was scared to death but at the same time I was fascinated because ever since I was a little girl I could see I've seen things and experienced things and just has I've had weird experiences but I had to look up and I'm, I was like five foot you know and I to have to look up, like break my neck basically to look up to try to see the face of this thing. I'd have to say it was at least eight feet, maybe eight, nine feet tall. And as they're running into the trailer, because they saw it better than I did, because they stopped and watched it, they had a little bit closer to it. It was further away from me because I was the furthest away from this thing. And it just brushes past me. I didn't feel anything, hit, you know, hit me. It brushes past me, and I just, in, in complete and utter shock, watched it literally only take three or four steps from me into the cornfield. I mean, I'm five. If I'm five foot, I mean, it was almost like it's it's length of how it walked. You know how it was. It wasn't running. It was almost like it. It's hard to explain. It was taking big long steps. Right. It wasn't running. And it went it ran into the cornfield and we all saw this thing. We knew it wasn't human. I couldn't see any, it was dark. It was all dark. It was, I couldn't see any clothing or anything on it. I should have been able to see something because you could see everybody. We could see what, what the people were wearing clothes. We could see what we were wearing. We could see our faces. You couldn't see it. You could see that it was just a dark, which I'm going, okay, we just saw Bigfoot because, and that's all we could think of is that, what well, is that what we saw? Because I couldn't fathom of, what it could possibly be because it how dark it was it's it's covering or whatever it was you know and how big steps it took we literally freaked out and we were trying to get into my grandma's trailer all at the same time through that door and you know of course we we, we all crammed in the door and she's cussing at us you know what's wrong with you kids you know and, and we told her and she finally said you know we that she finally had to sit down and tell us about what had happened with my her sons that they had actually come in contact with one many years ago when they were younger and why they had chased it the same property same property i'm like why didn't you tell us this i would have never i never went after outside after this never again would i go after side after this and we used to sleep outside and everything because it's country you know you never had to worry about anything they had the cows and chickens and that was another thing that we kind of wondered what was going on because the cows and the chickens she had a little farm they started they was acting up and we always knew when it was a small critter that was bothering the chickens, but when the cows and stuff start moving, they start acting up, the, my uncles would go out there with the shotguns and they would scare away or do whatever they had to do. But she told me, she finally said, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys about what's out there. There's, there's something out there. We, it's, this is what's been going on. And she told me this story about how this, the cows was acting up one night and they were going wild. And she called her two sons and she had a big family. She had like 12 siblings. And, my uncles are real big. They're like six, five, very big men. And she called the two oldest and said, you guys, Uncle D and, and Raymond, go get your guns and go get rid of this critter. That, you know, they thought it was like a wolf, timber wolf or something out here messing with the animals. And they go do their thing. And my uncle, and I asked him about this and he told me the story. And I, I just, I never went outside after this at nighttime in that area. He said that they saw, literally under the moonlight, saw, they thought it was a big man. They thought it was a big man because there was a, fam, a farm a, a couple miles over that had a habit back in those days because it was poor. It was around the 1940s, 1950s. It was stealing people's chickens and stealing, you know, stealing people's livestock because everybody was in, a, in you know, in bad shape. And he saw what he thought they thought was a big man pick up a baby calf. One of the cows had had a baby you know had a little baby calf you know you're you know here they go again the neighbors you know and he had thought for a second is that possible but then he said i'm a big man too you know he, i'm a big man that's that's probably doable he said they had to chase this thing all the way to the, the edge of the property which everybody had their fencing up to to block off the property he finally caught up to it because he was faster than my uncle raymond and he was, they're very feisty. My uncle, they would fight there, you know, beat people up. He was wanting, he said, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of this guy. He reaches up to grab and the, he said he, what shocked him was this person, he thought it was a person, was halfway over the fence. 
because that's what he knew. What was he dealing with? That was his words. What am I dealing with? This person's halfway over the fence. But he said he reached up to grab this person. He was getting ready to yank that thing down right off that man off the fence and beat the, he said he was going to beat the tar out of him. And he said when he grabbed a hold of him, he grabbed a hold of a handful of fur. And he said this thing looked around at him and growled and its eyes was red and he jumped back. He said it never, he's an, and they might, I've had such brave, these are, these are ex-military men. They're, and they never were scared of anything ever. I was, I was always looked up to these guys. And he said, that he almost, he said he almost defecated on himself. He said he was terrified. It was the first time in his life he had ever had this type of fear in him. He jumped back and he said it was, it, it felt like, like somebody had ripped his soul out of his, uh, he said he let go and he just jumped back and went, oh my, he said never again, every time he had to deal with that, if something happened with the animals, it was all, there was a whole bunch of, there was all like four or five brothers, they all went out. Because Raymond was a little bit slower than he was running, and Raymond had finally caught up, and he was wondering why Ray, why he wasn't jumping up after the guy. <laughs> He's like, "Why are you going after me?" He's like, "Dude, this is you know." Explain to him, "This is that's not human. That wasn't human. That was not a human." And I for him, and he when he told that story, you know, he said, "There's there's something out there." He goes, "There is definitely something out there, and it's going through these woods." And then my my dad had an experience, and he's. And my dad's the same way is never, I've never seen him afraid of anything, but he left his whole camping gear in that same area, went way back in the woods and was camping and, and he heard, <sighs> he heard something coming through the woods that he knew it was not, and he's a big hunter and he said he knew it was not anything that was, that was um, anything in that area. And he had weapons and everything. He said, I wasn't going to wait to see what was coming through that clearing. He goes, because what I had on me was not going to do it. He had to pick up his wife and my stepmother. She was passed out drunk because they were camping. He had to drag her by the hand and put her in the car. He couldn't wake her up. He left all his brand new camping gear behind and everything. He goes, I was not going to wait to see what was coming through that clearing. He goes, because the, br the branches that it was breaking as it got closer, because at first he thought it was a small, you know, something small because he went way back, way back in the woods because there was a little uh, lake area that had good fishing and very few people went back there because he's very familiar with the area. I mean, my father, he's a he's a bad man. <laughs> I'm just going to say he's a, I don't have a relationship with him because he's done bad things. He's not afraid of things. He's done some bad things. And for hear him tell this story, I knew he was serious. He was dead serious. So and he would never leave his equipment. And so he's, it's something in this area, that area that there's just, in the, in the things that we've heard in the middle of the screams, I'm, I'm talking the screams of, and I'm going, what kind of animal makes that kind of noise? So we stopped going out at night and, and it's, uh, yeah, you wouldn't catch me. There's no way. No, there's no way you'd catch me uh, in that area ever going out. And so we were always terrified after those experiences. So I never believed in that stuff as far as Bigfoot, because I always thought it was a joke. And and after that, I was like, nah, I don't care what anybody says. They can, you know, I'm the kind of person who would debunk things and um, kind of, I was the one laughing at people and nah, I, I don't do that anymore. I don't do that anymore. Uh, that was, we all saw that. We all know what we saw, and um, I'll never forget that. So that that wasn't that thing was huge. It was huge, and it took one one step of one step of my of its one leg. You know, just one length stride was my five feet, six feet stride of one. You know, it that's a that's a long that's a that's a long stride. You know, if it's just walking. Jeez. So, and, and I was right next to it. It was, it was right next to me. And I had, I, I'm just, yeah, we, yeah, we were scared. We were scared. We were all screaming because we all saw it. And yeah. So yeah, there's a, they're, they're out there. If people don't believe that that stuff exists, they're, they, whatever. They're just in denial. There's too what many people. A, what a fascinating uh, family history of, of encounters. Thank oh, yeah. you for, for sharing those. Would you be able to share anything about the location, like maybe just the county that it happened oh, yeah. in? It's, or it's, um, Do you know where, okay, there's Ohio. It's right on the border of Ohio line and PA line. 
Okay. And there's a lot of paranormal stuff that goes on here. Yep. I mean, a lot. I've got so I've experienced so much stuff in this area. And I remember talking to my grandma, and she finally told me she she told me there's a lot of stuff, and she had so many stories, and she was never she never told me anything wrong. It always came about um, because of you got the, you've got the West Virginia, the tri-state. It's the end of Enid. Think about Enid Valley. Look at um, Darlington. Okay, Darlington is it's right near Darlington. You got Darlington, PA, it's Enid Valley. Then you've got um, East Palestine, Ohio. Oh, okay, I'm from, yeah. Palestine, yeah. I'm from East Palestine, Ohio. Okay, so there's that that corner. It's like it's a tri tri state thing. You got West Virginia. I could go one direction and be in West Virginia. I could go over this way and I could be. MPA, just a matter of minutes from each other. And the, the paranormal stuff going on in, in Enum Valley in that area is, and I've experienced this stuff. And, and, and as, a, as, an innocent, as an innocent child, when you don't believe in those things and you think, you know, you're just not at that age where you believe in that stuff. And when you experience, you're going, I mean, children are innocent. You know, they don't, and as I, and as I got an older, I, I've had to deal with stuff. So it, yeah, I, there's something going on there and that, and I don't know if it has to do with, you know, the fact of the civil war, you know, anything like that. There's all that kind of stuff, but I, I, I can go get, take pictures of things and always get stuff. It's, it's weird. It's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, okay. especially my family, a lot of stuff. So extremely, extremely interesting. My, uh, contact info is Bigfoot society, gmail.com. If you ever want to pass that on to any other people that you know that have had uh, encounters in that area, uh, feel free to do so if you feel inclined. Yeah, yeah. I think they should go out there and get into the yep. deep in those woods and start hunting because it's there. There's just too many, too many, um, for some odd, I think it, um, I honestly, in my opinion, and I don't care if people think I'm crazy, I think there it goes in and out of some kind of parallel something mm -hmm. because it's so, it's, it's able to, travel so, like in <laughs> stealth you know it's got some kind of stealth thing going on for something that big and uh, to be able to hide a cave system or whatever i don't know but it's i, I don't know i i just I, know that it's, it's out there i it mean goes, you're not a, you're not the only one to have that idea like there is the a sighting years ago on skinwalker ranch where they someone allegedly saw one come out of a portal on the the branch property oh you, so, you know what yeah. we was out uh we camped out for three months underneath the superstitious mountains and really we saw i am not kidding this is i've told you i have a lot of experiences and all i, I never knew it and didn't know nothing about skinwalkers or none of this stuff i just got got uh, got to see the skinwalker ranch stuff started watching it this year actually and my dad, like I said, he, the guy was crazy. He, we had, he had us doing some crazy stuff. We saw, well, he, he actually thought it was our dog. And I said, dad, our dog don't stand on its hind legs and get up and walk around. Not like that. Not a chow chow. Well, it, the dog ended up showing back up. He chased this thing and ended up shooting it. And, and I'm telling, I don't know what it was. He caught, he skinned it. When he got brought it back, it was skinned. And I, it, we looked up on the hill and he's standing there. He goes, what was that standing up on the hill? Because him and my, him and his buddy was going to go right. We were going to chase wild boars. There was wild boars out there and he was going to go hunt one. He wanted to shoot because he likes to hunt. He thought he was chasing a wild boar. And we looked up, I looked up on the hill and said, dad, that's not, that's not a wild boar. It's tan Keller. It was tan in Keller. It looked like a human standing on top of a hill, but it looked like an animal at the same time. And I don't know if he was drunk or what he was on, but he was like, okay, we're going to go. He had in his mind, I don't know what he was seeing, but he thought that was a wild boar. And he did. He went and chased it. And I, I think something happened because he completely changed when he came back. He was a completely changed person when he came back. And I, if I could, if I had to tell the whole story, the stuff that happened in that desert after that, because we saw all kinds of strange things out there. Back in the 70s, that place wasn't um, built up. You didn't see all the homes there. I mean, right. we were way, way back out there. I'm talking way out there. He, I think my dad was seriously mentally ill because he had, he had some ideas that was crazy. And we just had to go along with it because that was 
he was our father but when he, when he came back he wasn't the same he started doing some strange things that i i don't know get on get on here and talk about but he wasn't himself and um we all saw what was on that hill that wasn't that wasn't an animal and i then i i didn't know nothing about shapeshifters or because we were real close to the apache you know the apache uh, uh what do you call it the reservation. You know, the reservation yeah we were real yeah. close to them and and everything and I don't know. I think he did something. He did something. And I think he invoked the wrath upon him because that said not too few hours later, a monsoon came and destroyed our camp. And we didn't even have any alert that it was coming. So it was something just, yeah, I, I, I got an idea of what a shapeshifter or a skinwalker what is, but that was the first time when I think back, that's what that could have had to have been what that was. It was standing up on his hind legs. We had binoculars and everything. Still that was not. I want to I want to check something real quick. So you said that your father saw something standing up on two legs that looked canine and then he shot and skinned it. Yeah, it was um he thought it wow. was a wild boar. Well, he when he brought it back skinned, we was he, he cooked it and everything. And but when I ate whatever the part I ate, I got sick, terribly sick. And I don't know when he knew what he was doing, but I don't think that's what he was chasing. I don't think he was chasing a wild boar because while well, I don't know of any wild boar that's tan in color. And what, not wild boars don't stand on their hind legs. So this is going to get really interesting. Um, so whatever was shot and skinned, you actually, he, it was cooked and then you had eaten some of it and then you yes. felt sick. I got sick as a dog. I was throwing okay. up. I had a stomach ache. And I think he invoked some bad mojo from whatever he did because he completely changed. He was continually trying to commit suicide. Yeah. So something, I think he did, he got, in, I don't know, possessed or whatever. I don't know. But at the time, I didn't know nothing about none of this. I didn't, I was, I was young. I didn't know anything about this. But as, you know, as I got older and I started studying and learning about all these paranormal things, because I just continued to experience things, see things and deal with stuff. I'm watching the skinwalker. I didn't know about none of these things. That had to have been what he was dealing with. I don't know. I don't know. Still don't know the full thing about skinwalkers. And it's there's so there's things out there and and people can say this stuff doesn't exist but i've seen so many things i've seen little things in my little little grays i've seen all this stuff and people have been with me and seen them that's never experienced this stuff before so i've had people say i never experienced this stuff until i started hanging out with you so <laughs> right. sure. not... yeah exactly yeah um i have another question about um, so when your father brought it back, skinned, and then before it was cooked, did you see the whole creature, even though it was skinned, whatever it was? No, no, okay. I didn't even, right. I didn't even pay attention to it because I, I just thought he, he, he right. knew what he was doing. That and oh. you're, yeah, exactly. Um, that's very intense. That's an intense story. Yeah, it's. it's oh wow. I, people, you know, people think I, I, I should write a book. I wish my sister was, no, my sister was able to, you know, because she would be able to be, be able to corroborate this, because we always had the radio. You know, where you could get all the weather and stuff, and you get you get warnings at least, and you get warnings of the monsoon, especially when they come up over the mountains. We there's no warning whatsoever. It destroyed our entire camp, literally, and I think he ticked off the. I think I believe the you know the Indians, American Indians, you know they got they got things going on out there, curses and everything, things you're not supposed to be messing around with and stuff. I got Cherokee and me and Blackfoot, and I just think he's messing around. My dad really looked a lot, it really looked Indian. He had a lot of Indian in him, and I think he messed up some stuff because it just came through and literally de just decimated our camp. Oh wow! We literally um, had to go hide. He just told me get your get some shoes on and go hide. I'm like what? <laughs> I was sick in my tent, you know, literally throwing up and, and that was my, he just, he wasn't, the, I had parents that just really didn't parent. Let's put it that way. I totally understand that. Um, an individual is asking, did your father bring the hide back after it was skinned? 
No. Okay. No. Gotcha. And I'm not, I don't know if it was because he didn't, I think when I think about how he was, he didn't want any of the, and anything causing other animals to want to come close to the camp. Like we were literally hardcore camping. Like we cooked on the rocks and, you know, we had our own little, I'm talking, he taught me how to do camping. Like you had nothing. The only thing that we had that was in any kind of domestic thing was that we had little like pots that you everything was made out of whatever we found out there in the desert and we had our tents we had basic tents they weren't no fancy tents we didn't have blow-up mattresses or anything like that i mean we lived like <laughs> like we were <laughs> you know back in the olden days i mean we he, yeah. he taught me a lot i mean he i even though it was rough he i he taught me a lot we had our own we carried our own weapons and everything but he kept everything that was that would cause animals, other animals to come into the tent, you know, wanting to come into our camp area, he would, he would have skinned it out away from the area and left, skinned it wherever he was, him and, it was him and Petey, it was his friend Petey that did it, that went hunt, hunted and hunted this thing down. So for, I don't know why, for the life of me, he would want to chase something that he didn't even, couldn't even identify what the heck it was. If I saw that and was trying to chase, I would not try to chase something that I'm looking at going, this doesn't look human or animal. You know what I'm saying? Animals don't walk on their hind legs. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I, I remember, I just remember that whole incident like it was yesterday. And I remember, I mean, he was an adult and I'm sitting there thinking, what the heck is he doing? You know, the child shouldn't be the one questioning you know what are you doing but i he would do crazy things like that that's why i was always just like dude i i was never surprised by the stuff he would do i had to go along with it you didn't question you did not question my dad so you know it was just that's just the way i was raised so he did some crazy stuff and there, there was a lot of things experiences of strange there was, and there was things flying around the sky, and I didn't know anything about Area 51 at the time either. We just saw it as, you know, I didn't believe in UFOs either. But we saw them. But then, but then I, but I didn't know, now I look back, I go, oh, well, no wonder we were close to Area 51. So it's, it's, I got to experience a lot of stuff, but some of it was really messed up. It's really messed up. I'm, I'm sorry you had to to live with that. I I hope things are are much better for you now. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I'm a born again Christian now, so okay. okay. <laughs> I, yeah. I just I just I'm I've been trying to make sense of all the stuff that I've experienced, and I you you can't. It's it's real. It's I've I'm. It's all real. It all happened, and I believe that there's other things out there. You know, I'm not I'm not one of them people who think it's all bull crap and you know doesn't just because i believe in heaven and hell and you know you know god and all that stuff no there's other things out there there's definitely oh, other things yeah. out there i've seen, seen too much of it and yep so but I, yeah i'm, I'm healed it, it just trying to explain this to other people is some people just think you're crazy and i at this point don't care because i know what i experienced and me and my brother, what me and my brother and sister have experienced, it was, it was hell, but it made us, made us who we are, you know? So, well, and, and the both of us, I mean, we both know there's a, a side to things. There's a supernatural side. There's things yeah. you can't see, but then sometimes you can see them, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and you've experienced that full firsthand, you know? Yeah. There's a there's a battle going on behind the scenes for sure. Oh yes, def definitely, definitely. Yeah, there certainly is. Mm. Well, I thank you for for coming up to to share uh, what you've experienced uh, over over the years, and and definitely I I did not know there was stuff like that happening around the East Palestine area on the oh, border. Yeah. So I will have that in mind. Yes. Thank you. Well, no problem. All right. Thank you for coming out. And then, uh, yeah, feel free to pass on my email if there's anyone else that uh, that you run into in the future. But thank you. No, no problem. You're welcome. Hey, Mama Bear.
Hey, can you hey, hear me? How's it going? Yes, I can, I can hear you. We are we are connected. I would love to not, hear what oh, you have what experienced there in Central Oregon. Here in Central Oregon. <laughs> well, not me personally, but um, I have friends who live on the res. And this one story um, comes from the, mo the mother that has lived on the res. And I'm guessing this had to be in like the 50s, the 60s. And... Uh, <laughs> When she was a little girl, her and her brother, um, they, you know, obviously lived on the res. Well, the little brother would always say, big monkey in the cornfield, big monkey in the cornfield. They would find footprints, but they never saw anything. Till one night, uh, she was upstairs doing her homework, and uh, she kept feeling like she was being watched. And she'd look around the room, no little brother bugging her. And then finally she looked out the window and she saw this face staring right at her. And in order to look through the window, you would need a ladder. And this thing was not on a ladder. And of course she freaked out, went and told the mom and dad. They immediately ran outside and all they heard was um, thump, 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 running away and then the corn uh, rustling. Um, then there's another story of my father. Now he was, uh, he used to drive a uh, truck for the Warm Springs, uh, mill and going up over, uh, Mount Hood, in fact, and it was winter time and him and the, uh, snow plows were kind of like not side by side, but they eventually came up and around a corner up on the paths together. So you got all these headlights loom in the area. They literally watched a being walk, go, step over the snowbanks. And if you've been on a, a pass, you know the snowbanks are pretty high being, with the snow being pushed uh, up against. And it stepped over like it was stepping over a curb, nothing. And it walked across the road, grabbed a tree branch, and pulled itself up over the snowbank and up into the tree line. And uh, they kind of went up the road a little bit, pulled over to check, kick the tires, and the driver, plow driver, asked Dad, did you see what I saw? Dad's like, yep, I sure did. Um, I believe it. There's just been too many stories, um, especially around here and other, you know, states, um, not to, not to believe that they don't exist. They have to exist. Too many experiences from different people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially oh, out there in that especially area. Especially out there in that area. Did he ever, Did he ever describe, what he, describe what he saw that day? what he saw that day? Um, just, it was tall, dark hair, and very, very hairy. And it just, it was like, kind of like a couple of blinks, you know, and dude was gone. I mean, it was like, Going on a four, uh, was it a four-lane highway or pass, you know, and he was across the road like literally two steps, you know. As you and I, we we'd have to you know jog across, but literally two steps, and he was up over over the up back into the tree line. It was, and there's other things that my father has seen, not just Bigfoot, but other things up on the uh, mountain. He had this. Well, he goes, it was a shape like a dog. But it ran, and Dad was doing like 70 miles in the log truck. You know, this is further back. And this dog uh, was actually getting ahead of him. And he's been around wolves and bears, and, you know, he's gone hunting up in the mountains. And he goes, this was just, he goes, it wasn't a wolf. There's just absolutely no way this was a wolf. Uh, I know they can run fast, but not like this from what my father was saying. Unfortunately, he's gone, so I can't, you know, get him on mm. the phone sort of thing and exp share the ex his experiences, but these are what he has told me. Uh, my mom, though, she did tell me uh, she had a friend in a group went camping, and exactly, it had to be up somewhere in Washington, and uh, probably around, uh, was it, uh, Mount Rainier. And um, 
everybody came, sitting by the campfire and everything, and all of a sudden, they, you know, smelled like this wet dog. I mean, like, someone needed a shower really, really bad. And this thing, like, just out of the, the campfire light, but yet you could see the shape. And everybody freaked, and everybody ran. You have some very, very interesting accounts. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, Monica. Thank you so much for coming out, Monica. Yeah, no problem. My first time. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully talk to you another time. Uh, thanks, thanks again for coming up. Thanks again for coming up. Yes, yes. You all have a great day. Hey, Leonard. This is uh, Jeremiah from Bigfoot Society. Do you mind if I potentially use this audio for my podcast? Absolutely. Go ahead. Awesome. Well, uh, what brings you up tonight? You know what? I'm walking by my local bass fishing pond. Okay, it's my early summer, and I walk by this plant on the ground. And I didn't think anything of it to begin with. And I walk back. So wait a minute. Who the hell would be walking out here in the picnic of briars and bare feet? <laughs> okay, it's so spread like they walk barefoot all the time. It's impressed about an inch deep into the soil, and it's about 13 inches by six inches wide. I use my buck knife for comparison. And I actually have pictures of it, and I was planning on, uh, I saw your uh, email here. I was going to send that to you. There's also some other things around some of the local areas there, like uh, laurel bushes. You know how tough a laurel bush is to break? Okay, this thing looks like it twisted a laurel bush off, bent it over, and then bent all kinds of sticks and angles on top of it. I have pictures of that, too, in the same area. <laughs> okay. And I, I thought I might have heard a knock one day. I'm not sure. So I knocked back and nothing happened. So that's the end of that story. It's just I can't confirm or deny that. Sure. You know, but uh, yeah, and the mountain is West Rock in Connecticut, South Central Connecticut. And somebody told me, like, yeah, somebody reported something big up here that wasn't a bear. And I'm putting two and two together. And this is where, okay, like I said, I've never seen anything personally, period. I want to. <laughs> but yeah, I have the print. I have the bent over and snap trees. And all kinds of other different things, like there's three, 30 or 40 foot trees that were ripped out of the ground and cut, not cut by axe or anything, it was ripped out, and they're like up in a triangle in the middle of the woods. I mean, what human would do this? Oh yeah. man, that that's <laughs> wild stuff. It, yeah, if you'd be able to send those over, I'd love to take a look at them. Larry. I would love to send those over. I'm not home now. I'm actually at Pet Boys, get my car serviced. But uh, yeah, take I, your time. I saw your email down there. And yes, I would love to send each and everything of that over. There's also a rock formation on the other mountain, the Sleeping Giant Mountain, that appeared overnight. Now these are two or three hundred pound boulders and a big pyramid formation. Now the closest there is a college right there. I'm thinking College Frank, but no, the closest quarry, okay, is down this huge winding trail. There's no way this thing's showing up overnight with college kids and rocks in that quarry. When you see it, when you see that too, you're gonna say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Right. Uh, so it's all in the same area, too. It's all right in this basic area on two different mountains. I live right between. Okay. You know, it's kind of, uh, and I'm thinking about all this stuff, putting it together, and I just came across your page here, and I said, let me listen to this guy. I never do lives, okay? But uh, I like the show Finding Bigfoot. It makes sense. And like the person before me said, there's so much evidence. Oh, yeah. It's it's wild, dude. Well, I am looking forward to uh, when you get uh, some time in the next few days, uh, send it over. I'll take a look, man. And uh, thanks so much for coming up, dude. Yes, I would love to have some communication with you. I don't know where you are, but maybe someday, like, uh, take a look. Yeah, absolutely. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Nice to speak to you. You as well. Hey, Brandon, this is Jeremiah. Thanks for having me awesome. on. Um, yeah. My Bigfoot encounter, it's nothing crazy. I didn't have eyes on anything. Um, but with all of the strange events that occurred, like, uh, it, I, I try to look at things from a skeptical viewpoint, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to instantly say, oh, that was a cryptid. Um, I spent a lot of time out in the woods in Northern Alabama on the Tennessee border. Um, <clears throat> so I know what the normal sights and sounds are. Um, but I, we were up on an old abandoned logging trail. Um, it was close to Plevna, Alabama, which is right next to the Tennessee border. Um, and we were riding up there one night, you know, we'd pull over like we always did, had bonfire. Um, we just, this night was different. We heard tree knocks. We had rocks thrown at us. Um, we were at the top of the mountain. It's not like they were rolling down from a higher elevation or anything like that. They were being actively thrown at us. 
And, um, I mean, we didn't feel scared or anything. We were just kind of laughing it off, you know, didn't think much, much of it. But what scared us is on our way back down, we had pulled over real quick to put on some music, to find some music. And that's when we heard it, um, the actual vocalization. And it was just a long, drawn out, like, whoop, um, kind of whoop, yell kind of deal. And we just like, we stopped and looked at each other. And we were like, dude, there's no way that's what that just was. Um, Cause you know, we, we being my generation, we're uh, pretty knowledgeable on cryptids and stuff. It's been a big thing for years. And like, we knew instantly that sounded just like a Bigfoot. That's the only sound that could have been. And then we heard it again and it was uh, a bit louder with a little more intention behind it. And we just, looked at each other again like we got to get out of here we didn't feel welcome uh we felt like th that was their last attempt to kind of push us down the mountain and get us out of there um but other than that that's the only f certain in my mind uh only certain bigfoot encounter i've had you know i've had the rocks thrown at me before and had tree knocks and stuff uh, but that was the only time I heard an actual vocalization that I could kind of connect with everything. Um, yeah, the rest of the encounters, as far as cryptids go in that same area, they were mainly uh, dogman related, um, which is a lot, <laughs> a lot different of an experience, I'll tell you that much. I don't know if you want me to get into all of them or anything, but it's just definitely a whole different experience. The vibe is completely different. Um, you know, I a lot of times you hear people talk about this negative energy that kind of comes along with them and i definitely experience that every time and that's how i knew before even anything else started that's how i knew something was off uh, so i don't actively pursue that on my channel but if it comes up as part of another interview uh yeah you feel free to if you're up for for sharing what you encountered with that as well uh that's definitely cool yeah, that'd be cool, man. Um, this one's definitely a lot more intense. There's a lot more detail to it. Um, so where I was living, this was all around, this was, I would say about two years after the incident on the old logging road. And that happened around 2014. So this would have been 2016, maybe 2017. Um, I was living out in Newmarket, Alabama, which is still very close to the uh, the Tennessee border. And I was taking a walk one night. I couldn't sleep. It was about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I get about a uh, half a mile into my walk down the street. And the first half of the street is lit up. All the street lights work. And then the second half of the street, once you get closer down to the creek and the woods, for some reason, all the street lights were out. Um, but I was walking, everything seemed fine. You know, I, I made that walk plenty of times. Um, and then I get almost all the way down this street. It was about a mile long. I get almost all the way down. I'll say about three quarters. Um, and I hear something jump out of the tree next to me. And when it hit the ground, I, I'm a I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm 300 plus pounds. When it, it sounded like it, if I would have jumped out of a tree, it was a heavy, heavy thud. And in that area, um, there's really nothing that would be up in a tree that size. Um, we don't really have black bears in that area. They're a little further north or further south. Um, there wouldn't have been mountain lions, and and you know they're very light on their feet. It wouldn't have sounded like that when they hit the ground. Um, but as soon as it hit the ground, everything got dead silent. And I instantly got hit with that dreadful, horrified feeling. I've never felt such fear in my life. And I didn't even see anything just upon that sound and it going dead silent. I got this sick feeling, this knot in my stomach and instantly went into tunnel vision and turned on my heel toe and started walking back down to my house. And I could hear this thing um, following behind me. It was pacing back and forth, like from either side of the street, but also tailing me. And then I got hit with this smell. It smelled like a dirty dog that had like rolled around in its own feces and urine. 
and it just like that's it, it was the heaviest smell it, it just kind of went along with the the feeling of dread it was just this heavy oppressive feeling and i didn't turn around to look at it man i i like physically could not do anything but walk at a steady pace only thing i could see was the street light in front of my house just tunnel vision um i make it inside I didn't turn around to see it or anything. I make it inside. And then for probably about a month or two after almost, almost every night, it was, it was like routine around the same time between two and four o'clock in the morning, I would get that same feeling and I would feel trapped in my room and I would feel the presence outside my window. Um, and once again, like I felt so drawn to look out the window, but I couldn't. I, could, I physically could not move. I was just like paralyzed in my bed for hours. This all up, it all it all kind of came to um, a climax when one night I was sitting on the porch around the same time smoking a cigarette. And from down that same road, the same direction where the thing had followed me from, I hear a bark and I'm like, okay, you know, it's plenty of neighborhood dogs. Um, and then I hear it again and it's a little closer, still not thinking anything of it. And then I see kind of- We were 10 years old. It took us huh? up until the age of- Hey, <laughs> you there? Thank yeah, you. I don't know we're what just happened. Like this, so. Um, just a second. That's weird. We're getting uh, audio from somewhere. That's really strange. I guess two days today. Um, Thank you for all sharing the live. To... Thank you for sharing the live. It's lines. like coming from another, another live. Oh. Yeah, it's not from my oh. side. That is really weird, man. Okay, uh, you want me to back Do you out? Think miracles or... are real, though. Absolutely. Yeah, miracles yeah are real. that's really weird. Um, okay. Sorry about that, man. Yeah, no I've been in a car accident, and if I it's really weird. Never had anything uh, like that happen before. I'm gonna disconnect from Brandon. Maybe he can send a request uh, to come back at a later time. That that's just very very weird. Uh, what do you think Bigfoot does during hurricanes? I don't know. Uh, that's gonna be the questions that's asked more and more. I think we need to focus on uh, helping people as much as we can, but I think that that question is going to start coming up and uh, be interesting to see what happens. Hey, Stacy, uh, thanks for coming up on stage. Uh, my name is Jeremiah. First off, I hope that you are safe down there in Tennessee. Um, I'm not in a um, an area that was hit by the by the floods. Gotcha. Good, good. That is good to hear. Uh, you're more than welcome to to share what you would like regarding uh, the story you put in the comments. Um, yes, my, my grandfather, he had um, eight children and 30 plus grandchildren, and he used to take us all individually at times hunting. And one of the places he enjoyed going was um, Hebbitsburg area. It's in Fairfield Glade, Tennessee. And um, he leased a piece of property and would take us individually. And one day he come home and he said, we're never hunting there again. And he went on to sit my uncles down and tell them about the Bigfoot that he saw. I was very young when this happened, but the, the creature that he saw, he said it was, it was large. It was a large man-like figure. It was much bigger than him. And he was six, two. And um, he said the smell, the smell is what hit him first. Um, just like other animals can smell you when you're in the woods, um, you take precautions to not be sniffed out by deer. And he said that this, this smell just hit him out of nowhere. He said um, it was kind of the same smell of that wild dogs have. And, um, he was sitting in the tree stand and he smelled this thing and he watched it come across a ridge and down in front of him and across a creek and up the hill away from him. And when it was on the other side, he got out of his tree stand and went back to the truck and never went back. Wow. Yeah, he said he, he watched it and he believes that it probably knew he was there 
but it didn't stop and interact or anything and it didn't act scared and take off running it just continued on its path and moved away from him but it scared him that he never went back and this man he you know he was invincible he was like a superman figure in my family he wasn't scared of anything so it i believe him when he tells when he told the story when i was a kid Mm, wow thank you thank you for sharing that uh part of your family history that is absolutely incredible um living in uh tennessee i'm not sure what part even you are but is it a thing down there where you hear uh stories and accounts of that are similar to to this often or oh yeah i mean not particularly the smell um, but of course it's, I don't know that anybody else in my family has seen one. Um, but just from other locals, yes, there, there are similar stories to what the, what the creature looks like and how it moves and in the area we've had, we've actually had Bigfoot hunters come down and explore the area. We have a Bigfoot festival every year where lots of people come, but it's a very popular area for Bigfoot sightings. Mm, that the you, the Fairfield Glade area. Yes, there's um, it's grown up a lot in the past few years just because it's become like a retirement community. There's thousands of people that live there, but when you move past Fairfield Glade and go into the Hebbitsburg area, it's very rural, and there's there's nothing there. It's not cell phone towers. It's pretty much just hunting land, and it backs up to. Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the, it's protected land. It's like the big South Fork area. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So this is like around Catoosa and Catoosa WMA is pretty big. Um, yes. It's Frozen a very Heads. large area. Yeah. Frozen has a pretty interesting area too, from what I've heard. But it looks like that's further East. My grandpa always had a theory that they lived in the cave systems and if you look at the cave systems that live on that are underneath Tennessee in the Appalachian Mountains, there's it's a mammoth cave system. So to me, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, I, I mean, I've I've heard that uh, theory as well from many, many different people, and I'd say it's it's probably pretty accurate. Uh, it just makes sense that they would take advantage of a, a natural uh, shelter like that. So. No, oh, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. You guys have a good day. Absolutely. Thanks, Stacy. Oh, bye-bye. That was a great uh, anecdotal story from her family history. Thank you for coming up, Stacy. Amanda, what's up? Hey, Jeremiah, what's up? I'm actually at the museum currently, and uh, I will be fully available to do whatever you need me to do. I just wanted to reach reach out and see how uh, things are going down there at the museum. Uh, things are going really good. Um, we are open for business as normal. Um, a lot of the area to the northeast of us got hammered pretty good with a uh, Hurricane Helene. And um, so we're just trying to keep an eye on that. Unfortunately, some of uh, my coworkers have family members up there that they still hadn't got contact. But uh, as far as the museum is concerned here, everything's up and running and per normal, we're glad to be open. A lot of people are coming through or trying to escape from those areas, you know, take their kids somewhere to get their minds off of it and stuff. So really happy to be here to, to do that for them. I'm glad that you, it sounds like uh, you're okay. Your family's okay, uh, which is, is good. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, we're okay. Okay. Family's okay. We only lost power for a little while. Um, they did have it all forecasted to come right over our area uh, initially, but during the night, the storm turned. So probably about, I think no more than 60 miles from us to the, uh, to the east. That's where it got the worst of it. So fortunate for us, very, very unfortunate to our um, other folks. Mm. The Appalachian. Have you had any uh, interesting uh, ones that have come in lately in general from people that you've been able to talk to? Oh, yeah, I've got some really, really good ones. Um, ones that can't necessarily make public right now, but I can't right. say that it is something international. 
so from somewhere overseas and that's about all i can give and that yeah it's it's really oh. cool i'm super excited for it oh my goodness that just got me super excited that's amazing um wow I'm yeah trust sure me that... i was like a little kid Ugh. in the candy shop when i started talking to him i was like is this actually happening right now <laughs> but no yeah way. i had to keep my composure a, but yeah it's a current yeah it, it's current thing oh my goodness they visited the museum and gave the information and yeah i can't give specifics on anything except you know that it's somewhere overseas i'm currently talking with them and um getting video evidence and all kinds of good stuff this one's a really cool oh, one i'm excited it's video this is amazing so uh, i'm not going to press you anymore because we're just not going to do that but um what are ways that, that people can uh i'm sure this will come out eventually and uh where can people be watching to see when it does hopefully if i'm able to make it public um True. which is about 50 50 chance you know mm -hmm. just because you know you have to take a lot of people in the big outside of bigfoot stuff to have to understand you know, a lot of this stuff you know is very private you have to have that trust with some of your witnesses that you know they're you're not going to share this information publicly because they don't want the yep. ridicule or their job might take it to where you know they you know it could affect them professionally so you know you have to take a lot of those kinds of things into consideration so if it does it will most likely either be through expedition bigfoot through the museum here that would make it public or it would be at any of my other social awesome. media that's awesome so just to make that really clear that's the expedition bigfoot museum facebook page and not the tv show they are not connected that is correct. We tease all the time that this is the original Expedition Bigfoot because we were here long before the TV show. <laughs> Do you get people that come in that are like, "What? This isn't like a, this isn't like the TV show." Yeah, we get that all the time. And so strangely enough, we actually get more, more uh, phone calls than we do people coming in. People call all the time. We can always tell when the Discovery Channel is either putting out new episodes or stuff. People yep. will call in. It's like, hey, I saw such and such in the background and you guys completely missed it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Hang on. Are you talking about us or the and I start giving more info about the it's they're referring to the TV show. That's awesome. Oh, and man, actually, that, we've that's gotten wild. some good stories out of some of those calls like that, which is really fun. I bet. Yeah, man. Again, I'm going to say it again. You got one of the best jobs in the world, you know, for someone I, who's in, in the Bigfoot. It's very cool. So It is. I am very, very blessed. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm just going to be clicking refresh all day long on the Expedition Bigfoot page because uh, if this does come out, I want to see uh, in the future what it is. But Amanda, thanks for coming up real quick to kind of share an update about how things are going there. And can you remind uh, people how they can uh, check out the museum and where you're all located and stuff? Absolutely, yes. So the museum is Expedition Bigfoot Sasquatch Museum, and it is located in Blue Ridge, Georgia. That's in the North Georgia mountains, uh, almost right at the Tennessee border. It's a very, um, for lack of a better word, tourist type area. Now, a lot of people come up here into the mountains to escape the cities and things. So that is our main location right off the main thoroughfare here. And you can uh, find the Bigfoot Museum either on their website, which I actually helped build, a little shameless plug there, <laughs> um, is expeditionbigfoot.com. Or you can go to their Facebook page, also Expedition Bigfoot, but make sure that it is our logo. Very recognizable once you see it. Uh, and no, it as far as myself, and as far as myself is concerned, um, you can always find me on any of my social media platforms as Amanda the Bigfoot Lady. And I also, you can contact me through email at Amanda the Bigfoot Lady at gmail.com. Um, I'm always open to collect stories. Um, we're not like some of the crazy stuff, even here at the museum, I'm referring to as well. We're yeah. not like the crazy TV shows where we're going to come out with a big camera crew and all this kind of crazy stuff. You know, we're really just here to collect the information, collect the stories, because if it wasn't for witnesses, we wouldn't have any of this information to even start with. So, yeah, that's that's what I'm all about Same here. Same here. It's it, the way you guys do things is very close to the way I do stuff with the podcast. So appreciate you being there and uh, and everything you do, David. 
does and everyone who's associated with the museum. But thanks again for, for coming up for a bit. It's fun getting caught up with you, Amanda. Awesome. Yeah. Real quick before I pop off here, um, I mentioned the um, big the Expedition Bigfoot Facebook page. Um, yes. David actually yes. runs that himself. So any of the stories and uh, things that he is posted on the Facebook page there comes directly from him and his wife. And those, oh, wow. any of this, those stories and stuff like that, you know, it's that it's the real deal when it's coming from him. <laughs> uh, that's all. Yeah. No, David's got the stuff. He's got the the good stuff. That's good to know. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, you guys have a good day and a uh, keeper between the ditches up there, as we say down here. Yes. Yep. Have a good one. Hi there. Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Uh, you can just say Sin. Okay, cool. All right. Um, Sin, thanks for coming up. What are you guys uh, up to out there in Ohio? You had anything, any cool stuff happen out there? Uh, we are currently searching, researching a private property right now. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the group, the Ohio Night Stalkers. Yes. I am one of their members. Um, so we actually have a trip coming up here for their 10 year anniversary. The whole group's kind of getting together, but we're going out to a few new spots and hoping to get, get some new, new sounds and some new evidence going. That's awesome. How long have you been a researcher for? Um, probably about two years i've always been interested you know my dad used to talk about stories and things like that but i met the ohio night stalkers about two years ago at a conference and i was lucky enough for them to let me come out and i kind of hop between their group and a few other people and just you know get out there and have some fun nice but so personally uh have you had any uh, interesting encounters yourself. Have you been fortunate enough to experience anything out of the ordinary? Oh yeah, I have seen so so much. Um, my first encounter was in Kentucky, and it was just the craziest thing. And this thing just came up on two feet, and it just really took me by surprise. And you know, I don't, it's a always a debate about what Bigfoot actually is, but. You know, we shined a light on this thing and it wasn't there. Um, so that really piqued my interest even more than when I was a kid. And ever since then, being with the group, I have I got to see one last spring. It was a juvenile. Um, that was actually made my heart stop, you know, because <laughs> you, you hear things and things happen while you're out there. But to actually see one run by was, it was actually pretty crazy. <laughs> wow. Was that... um. Was that on the private property in Ohio then? Uh, yeah, it was on somebody's private property. Unfortunately, I wish I could give you details, but like the oh no, that's <laughs> that's actually not a problem at all. I never press like if I know it's a private thing, I never press for it. Um, but uh, thank you. So, so you got a good look at it. Um, do you remember any details about uh, what you saw when it when it ran across? Oh yeah, it was. So being a juvenile, it was probably about three and a half, four foot, not very old, not very big. Um, the speed on this little guy was just inhuman. It was just so fast. It was kind of like a blink of an eye thing, but it was gray, which is, you know, Ohio seems to be known for their gray and their white ones for, you know, whatever unknown reason, but it was about a light gray and you know, I could see the, the hair on the arms and it came down to the hands and it was it was really neat. I didn't get a good look at the face since it ran by so fast, but he was a hairy guy. <laughs> wow. How many how many sightings have been uh, roughly how many sightings have you guys had in that area? Um, sightings, not not very many, um, but we do have some pretty solid uh, audio. We've had David Ellis go over quite a few of our audio and he can confirm professionally that, you know, what we've caught, there's there's no known animal in North America that pegs these high on a spectrograph. And we've had, you know, the calls and the whoops and the rock throws. One of our guys, his windshield on his car actually got busted up one day. <laughs> so it's it's been a pretty good adventure.
Wow. Are you guys getting percussive language there? Um, we did have, so they brought Russ out from Expedition Bigfoot to one of our locations and he can, you know, I'm sure if you watch Expedition Bigfoot or, you know, if you were at the Mothman Festival, he talks about how he did hear the language one time while we were out there, but I've heard it myself at a different location in Kentucky. So it's definitely something different to hear. So you've heard that live. Yes. Yes, I have. Oh, wow. Okay. So I, so I went out to Oregon and, um, we captured a gentleman in my group. This is in the Willamette national forest. He captured some stuff that no one else heard except for one lady in the group. And I had David listen to it as well. And he's like, yeah, that's percussive language. I was like, it's weird. Cause I was right there and I didn't hear it. So that's amazing. You heard it live. Yeah, it's like, I want to say I'm sorry that you didn't get to hear it because it's definitely, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where they say, you know, it sounds like they're speaking English and you, you, you're like, your brain wants to register what they're saying, but the more you listen to it, the more you realize that, you know, there are like, it sounds like vowels and different words, but it just sounds like gibberish at the same time. Did yours sound like anyone's voice in the group? We have had that happen, not at this specific location. Um, this was more the one in Kentucky. This was my first um, encounter with what I believe was one. We did hear more. It was probably going on for about 10 minutes. And I kind of feel like an idiot for not trying to record it, but it was so quiet. Um, but at other different locations, we have heard where it mimics, um, which is really, really off-putting. You know, if one of us does a call or any kind of talking in general, we've had that call back where it does sound like it's imitating. And we've also had what sounds like women crying, not your typical like coyote calls, but what sounds like women crying. And we've actually heard a cow before. <laughs> oh, no way. Oh, wow. That's, that's incredible. Um, so I asked the thing about leading into the mimic because, and I haven't really released this audio yet on my podcast. I, I will eventually, but, um, the part where David said, yeah, that's percussive language, the audio, it sounds like my voice. Ooh. And then I was like, I don't really know how to handle this. Right. And he pretty much showed me, he was like, like the way it looks on the spectrograph, it doesn't, it's not how the human voices look. And I'm st still trying to wrap my mind right. around that, you know, like, yeah. yeah. It's like the freakiest, but the coolest thing at the same time. <laughs> no, really. Does it sound like live? Does it sound like mumbling at all? It did. So when this happened, this was around... 2019 and we were on private property that backs up to daniel boone and you know it's kind of a long story but to cut it short you know it just some really weird things started happening and we had the orbs in the sky and we had what sounded so i'm indigenous so it sounded like like the old time like when tribes used to have their their parties and the drums and everything like that and you know, we were kind of like thinking like, this is really weird. We were telling ghost stories, but his nearest neighbor was an elderly couple that was a mile in the opposite direction. And the longer this, you know, it sounded like a party going on, the longer this went on, the weirder things started to get. And we started having like two to three piece whistles that were responsive to our whistles. And we even changed our whistles and it actually mimicked our whistling back. And after that happened is when the the talking and the language started and it just sounded like two of them kind of just having this conversation back and forth and it did sound a little bit like mumbling at some point but it was so quiet and i don't know if you know it sounds silly to say i don't know if they were whispering or if it was just one of those things where we only heard it and i don't know if like the next person would have heard it as well you know what i mean but uh -huh. wow yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've heard live, uh, it's almost like a murmuring, mumbling type thing uh, yeah. out in the woods in an area in Iowa, uh, in 
it's just it, it's weird because your logical side of your mind wants to wants to not say it's bigfoot but right. like just where it's happening in the time it's like logically you know it can't be anything else so it's weird but um yes yeah, Jen, thank you for coming up i mean um uh, uh, please reach out to me uh my email is bigfoot society gmail.com i'd love to you know keep in touch with uh you and your group yeah of course thanks for uh, awesome. having me here i love sharing Absolutely. this stuff, thank you for doing what you do you got it have a good one you too please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on youtube making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications and share the episode on youtube with a friend also if you're listening to us on a podcast thank you so much make sure that you're subscribed share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. If you've had any encounters in Oregon, which I'm sure there's probably a few of you out there, please feel free to reach out immediately. You can use email bigfootsociety at gmail.com. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it. If you want to join in the fun, you can join over at patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. I'll see you there. And again, thanks for listening. I can get on here and we can tell our stories. Maybe there's somebody else out there listening that's too afraid to tell their story. Maybe this will give them the courage to come out and not feel so bad about it. Who cares what anybody thinks? I know what I saw. I know what's out there. That's all I care about. people know. Please let them know if you ever see one of these things. You need to tell. Because if you don't, then shame on you. You know? Shame on you.